There is nothing to suggest that Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte really appreciated life in Sweden. There was a great deal that was worse than in France. Swedish food, aquavit, the cold and the rain, to say nothing about the journalists. And his wife, Desiree, hated the country at first. But Bernadotte was a conscientious soldier and official. He did his job and he did it well. Without him, Sweden today would have been quite different, probably much worse country. The man who was elected successor to the throne of Sweden on the 21st of August in 1810, and who ascended to the throne as Karl XIV Johan eight years later, was undoubtedly one of the best heads of state Sweden has had. He is also literally the only one who has been headhunted for the position. He became king on his merits. The normal procedure is that kings inherit their positions or that they seize the throne by force. Not so Bernadotte. Jean-Baptiste was born on the 26th of January in 1763, son of Henri Bernadotte and his wife Jeanne. Henri was a procurator, a rank in the legal profession below that of an advocate, and he belonged to an old family of the petty bourgeoisie in Pau. After having worked in an office for a couple of years, Jean-Baptiste changed course on the death of his father in 1780 and enlisted in the army. After the French Revolution, his career advanced swiftly. By 1794, he had been promoted to general. His military career was followed by an equally impressive civil one. Bernadotte became ambassador in Vienna, minister of war in Paris, marshal of the French Empire, grand officer of the Legion of Honor, prince of Ponte Corvo, governor of Hanover, and administrator of Hamburg, Bremen, and Lübeck. Unfortunately for him, his integrity was such that he did not always do as Emperor Napoleon wished. This led to periods of disfavor and unemployment, albeit spent in the comfort of his own residence in Paris. It was on one such occasion, in the summer of 1810, that the marshal was offered a chance to be a candidate for the throne of Sweden. On the 20th of October the same year, the new successor to the throne landed in Helsingborg and took the name Karl Johan. More than anything else, the distinctive feature of Bernadotte's achievement as Sweden's head of state was his competence. Bernadotte knew how to govern kingdoms, cities and villages, how to negotiate with foreign regimes, how to hasten slowly but surely in war. Above all, his experience of armed conflicts came in handy. When Bernadotte opportunistically turned his coat to join Napoleon's enemies and attached Norway to Sweden in a foreign policy union, he did all he could to avoid having his kingdom drawn into devastating new wars. None of the projects launched by Bernadotte was as lasting and significant as this. Since 1814, Sweden has enjoyed more than 200 years of peace, a unique record in world history. Peace, together with the smallpox vaccine, the agrarian reforms and the spread of potatoes as a crop, resulted in a formidable population growth. In the 19th century, Sweden's population became so large that a quarter of the inhabitants were able to emigrate to America, and still the demographic expansion did not stop. Peace made it possible to build prosperity. Karl XIV Johan endeavored to increase grain production by establishing county agricultural societies and an agricultural academy. Farming was dramatically improved, partly through potato cultivation, so that Sweden, from having been dependent on imports, was actually able to export agricultural produce. Thanks to the smallpox vaccine and the growing number of midwives, mortality was greatly reduced. Population growth had the effect that Sweden, at the death of Karl XIV Johan, had almost as large a population as the kingdom had had before the loss of Finland. Moreover, Large investments were made. The Göta Canal, which later voted as Sweden's prime historic monument, was opened in 1832, significantly reducing travel distances. The Karlsborg Fortress was built beside the canal as the main base for Sweden's defense in the event of an enemy attack. Karl Johan himself became increasingly conservative through time. In my youth I was a republican, but now I am a royalist, he is reported to have said in his autumn years. And the people around him noted that there was undoubtedly good reason for this. 
The reign of the old king is often referred to as the bedchamber government, since he liked to govern from his bed. The monarch used censorship, imprisonment and treason trials to clamp down on the opposition. He intervened against newspapers whose journalists and editors displeased him. This particularly affected Lars Johan Gerda and his newspaper Aftonbladet, issues of which were repeatedly confiscated. The conflict with the opposition pales, however, in comparison with everything that Bernadotte accomplished during his time as king. The policy of peace, the expansion of agriculture and the construction of the Göta Canal are just three examples. Add to this the hard but successful work of improving Sweden's wretched finances, which required huge personal sacrifices from the king to restore the banking and coinage system and to repay the state's heavy foreign debts. To achieve the latter, the king used a large share of his own money, which he had received as payment for ceding the French colony of Guadeloupe in the West Indies. It is no exaggeration to say that the history of modern Sweden begins with Karl XIV, Johan. The population growth, the policy of neutrality, the concern for peaceful trades, the introduction of elementary school, the right to vote in elections to municipal bodies, and a great many other investments in the infrastructure. All this can be traced back to the reign of the first of the Bernadottes. On his deathbed, Bernadotte dictated the following words to posterity. I do not wish for death. I do not fear it. My life has run for over 80 years. Nature reclaims its right. No one has had a career like mine.